When was the first time we thought about the importance of water? During the ongoing Californian and Middle Eastern drought, the famous Australian drought, 1850s, before Christ, when? Indeed, we were very smart. We got it from the very beginning as we developed our major civilizations around big rivers, rivers like Tigris and Euphrates, Nile, Indus, and Yellow. Water is the most essential element of life. We need it for drinking and sanitation. We need it to produce food. We need it to produce power and cool our power plants. And we need it for maintaining our ecosystem services. So what, what's going to happen with the growing population? We already have problems with water. Not everyone has enough access to water. 15% of the world population lack access to clean water. That number is 50% in Sub-Saharan Africa. The modern people, the developed ones, are also changing their diet. Ironically, they prefer meat to vegetable, the unhealthy diet. That means 15,000 liters of water instead of 2,000 liters of water per kilogram of food. So to feed the 2 billion extra people joining us on this planet, we need to raise 60% more water. We are already bankrupt. We don't have that much water. We have to increase the water withdrawal by 50% in the developing world and 18% in the rest of the world. The planet is getting dry. Water is becoming more scarce. Two billion people are expected to live in dry areas of the, of the planet with extreme water scarcity. Add to this the pressure of climate change, which is going to reduce the rainfall and increase evaporation. We have already exhausted our surface water resources. Lakes are going dry. Rivers are going dry. And now we are tapping the groundwater. The fossil resources which are, going, which are not going to get replenished. And things like recycling and re-drinking our urine would not help much. You think that's the end of this story? Actually not. The situation is more complex because water has no respect for our political boundaries. We set the political boundaries without paying attention to the water boundaries, water basin boundaries, watershed, river basin. Water drops want to move freely within the basin from one location to another, along the river, toward the drainage area. And they're not like us. They don't have passports, so we can't, we can't ask them for visas. They want to pass the border. So what happens is that we have 148 countries sharing 276 international river basin. What does that mean? 45% of the, the earth land area, 40% of the population lives in these areas, and 60% of the water flows at a global level are provided in this area. Imagine what happens when you have more than one country managing water. Doesn't matter if you're upstream or downstream, how powerful you are, it's probably in your best interest to maximize your use, minimize the outflow, or beg for more water. Because you don't, even if you don't need it today, tomorrow you will need it. So what happens is a lot of competition. Even if you need to do it superficially, you're going to maximize your, your use. Build a lot of dams. Transfer water from one location to another. And waste it. At least you can establish some right to that water. That creates chaos, competition. And as water becomes more scarce, there's more chance of water conflicts. And that's a scary situation. Some people think it's beyond conflicts. We might have wars over water. Kofi Annan thinks that the fierce competition over water might end up in a war. Petro Scali and other UN Secretary General 
What did he say? He thinks that water can become more important and more significant than oil. And the Middle East might experience a war over water. And the former vice president of World Bank thought that the 21st century wars would be fought over water. Huh, water war. That's interesting. It was interesting when I heard it. And I really wanted to know if there will be any water war. Have you ever had any war over water? Why was I interested in water war? Because I was always dreaming about playing it since childhood. Of course not. Of course not. Water and war are two important things for me. I'll tell you more. The real story. Why water? I was passionate about water. I think I had no choice but being passionate about water. Because I was the only child of the parents who were working for the water sector. In fact, they dated and got married when they were working for the water sector. So I'm thankful to water for giving me great parents. So studying water was the least I could do to thank him. Beside that, I was interested in war. Why should I be interested in war? I grew up in Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. I have a clear crystal picture of the first missile attack to Tehran, 29th of February 1988, when I was only six. Big explosion a few meters away. Nothing happened to me, but I remember my mom injured and she was in blood. I was confused. To date, I still panic about it and I have nightmares of planes attacking our neighborhood. That confusion, that explosion, I didn't know what was going on. So war would be the last thing I would be interested in. On the contrary, I like peace, like many of you. I want to find ways to prevent conflicts and make the world a more peaceful place. So I had to find a way to study things, study water conflicts. I was an engineer interested in politics and social sciences. So my colleagues and peers thought that's lack of competence because you're getting out of mathematics and computer modeling. So I had to find a way, and I think I did. I used game theory. Game theory is a mathematical study of cooperation and conflicts. I use game theory to understand why people might behave dif different in different ways in different situations. I want to understand their incentives, why they do certain things. When, when they're in conflict with other people, they have a range of options to pick from, they have preferences over the possible outcomes, and they have to think about all moves and counter moves of all players in the game if they want to make a good decision. It's like playing chess or poker with others. Now, this field is a very growing field. It's becoming more and more popular and lots of people are using it. We have been using it for water resources modeling and understanding conflicts. You probably remember this face. John Nash and the Beautiful, Beautiful Mind movie. That's a guy who has made a lot of contributions to this field. So I, we ended up modeling a lot of conflicts around the world. Conflicts in the Jordan River Basin, Nile River Basin, conflicts in Iran, conflicts in California, all over water. The other thing I do is a lot of gaming. Remember, I told you I was the only child. So I didn't have a lot of gaming experience. So I do it with my students in class. We play a lot of games. It's probably more fun. So we play water games, and I try to collect information from them, behavior information, the information which is really hard for me to get if I go to the field and do experience in the field. So I collect the information. They have fun. But to ensure that they show their real behavior, what I do is that I tell them that their grade, in the ex the grade, their grade in the assignment would be their performance in the game. 
So they play a lot of games during the course, and I collect a lot of information and use that information to develop management institutions, water management institutions, which are less vulnerable to conflict. So let me tell you what I've gained by experience out of 10 years of modeling and gaming. Water conflicts, yes, they exist. And as water becomes more scarce, you will see more, more water conflicts, more water tension, especially at lower levels between farmers, between provinces and, and states. But one thing is important. Water conflicts are never only about water because water is tied to so many other things, to food, energy, the independence of your nation, economy, politics, identity, dignity, and so many other things. So even if countries claim that they're only bargaining over water, it's much more than that. It's beyond that. So water will be used as a weapon to threaten the neighbors. This will go on forever. But once you, have, once you realize there are so many connections between water and other resources, you realize there are a lot of opportunities for trade. You can trade water for food, trade water for energy, trade water for a better reputation at the international level. So there are so many opportunities. And fortunately, history shows that the cases of cooperation have been much more than conflicts. That's promising because human beings might become more efficient when things get scarce. Of course, that's an optimistic hope, but it might happen if we want to discover these opportunities. History shows that war has never been the only cause of water conflicts. And to be specific, a water war. We never go on a war only for water, but war, water can catalyze war, can catalyze conflicts, and it can catalyze cooperation. With the other experience, the experience which was, was about bitter at the beginning, I was modeling and I was excited about these things. And as part of a project I had named Hydro Solidarity, I got a chance of visiting Africa. We wanted to bring peace to the night with a bunch of theologists, engineers, lawyers, and health experts. We went there and I was so excited. I had a lot of questions to, to, to get responses for. I wanted to collect field data. So when we go there, I realize all these people are spending so much time getting their, you know, getting, getting their water, drinking water, filling up their buckets for hours, school hours, work hours spent in line for water. So I was thought, you know, based on the theory that there will be fighting. I was expecting them to be fighting because if you spend so much time, at some point you get exhausted. And if you see someone crossing the line, you might have a fight. It was obvious to me that they would fight a lot. So I had asked this guy, our host, the tall guy in the middle, who had lost all his family in a genocide, in the genocide of the 90s in Rwanda. I asked him to ask the villagers how often they fight over water. Guess what the response was? Translation took a bit longer than usual. I was realizing, okay, like, you know, I just asked a short question. This is taking so long. They're going back and forth. I knew something was going on. He turned back to me with a smile and an answer which really embarrassed me and my knowledge. They never fight. They never understood my question. These guys never fight over water. And that made me think, why not? Indeed, they do that to be stronger as a community. They're cooperative. They cooperate to be stronger, to be able to stand tough situ in tough situations and back up each other. During food shortage, water shortage, loss of family, and even genocide. What is the other option, a Western option maybe? To be competitive, to kill, not to be killed. 
over water. So it's just a matter of perception. It depends on how we want to see these games. We're playing these games every day in our life, no matter where in the planet you are. We're playing virtual games over water, over food, over energy, over emissions, over air, virtually or actually. So no matter where you are in the world, you are contributing to conflict or peace. Now you got and we got to choose if we want to play it competitively or as Rwandan started, do it. In the first case, you see this game. You perceive it as a Wall Street game, as a competitive game, in which you do anything to win the game. And in the other one, you realize that to be happier, if you care about the rest of the planet, you have to sacrifice a little. You need to conserve. We need to conserve. We need to reduce our footprint. We need to do less harm to the environment to make the globe happy and care about the future generations. And I hope we all remember Sadi's advice. Human beings are members of a whole. In creation of one essence and soul, if one member is afflicted with pain, others uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human cannot be changed. Thank you.